collaboration is another way of doing things here. Uh, I've heard Mr. Bauker speak a few times, usually with lots of humour and lots of challenge, <laughs> but always fun. So I'm looking forward to this. So can you please help me welcome Mr. Will Bauker for the collaboration section. Madam Toastmaster, ladies and gentlemen, 19, the man, the man we are thinking about this evening is, the best word I can find for him is a maverick. Maverick is someone who does things not to the way they're traditionally done, but the way he would like to do it, and orthodox. And the man we honor this evening is indeed a true maverick. He does not slavishly follow norms and he makes his own decisions. 1979 was a dreadful year in world history. There were serious disasters in 1979. Britain appointed their first woman prime minister. Margaret <laughs> Thatcher. And two years before said, heaven forbid that the British government ever has a woman prime minister. The nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island exploded, embarrassing the Americans considerably. Elvis Presley's records were not on the parade, mainly because he was dead. <laughs> but the hit of the year was a read a song called Rhinestone Cowboy. And I'm sure that our musical members will remember it. Our special guest, however, brought sunshine to South Africa because he was inducted on the 1st of October, 1979. Amongst his achievements, we see that he was the president of Forum in 1985, and he was the area governor in 1990. And I speak, of course, of Peter Miller. Peter, Tony, in his typical way, wrote me a whole lot of articles about him, and he asked me to please apologize profoundly, profusely, I think he said, that he's not able to be here this evening to honor you. But here are some of the things that Tony says about Peter Miller, and I'm going to read them verbatim. Peter Miller, Tony says of Peter Miller, I recall that he is the only man I know who can be late for a meeting in his own home. <laughs> As an Exco member, the meeting was in his house when he was president, and he arrives 10 minutes late. <laughs> Tony lays the blame for this on Peter's Irish ancestry. He suggests that the Irish aren't the best timekeepers. And hair, red, slowly turning gray, is another measure of this man. Ironically, Tony doesn't go on to say that he too is of Irish origin. Then he goes on to say, he remembers another incident. Peter is the only member to have been thrown out of one of the club's business meetings by the business chairman for disruptive conduct. Disgusting <laughs> So we threw him out, he went to the pub, bought himself a drink. And the next meeting we had to draw lots for who would do the different jobs. And he drew the job of being chairman. And when you're the chairman of the business meeting, you can't throw yourself out. <laughs> so he survived that meeting, he had to behave himself. I want to call on one of our members, Bruno Schuster. Bruno Schuster has known Peter for many years, and I'm going to ask Bruno Schosser to please share with us an item that he remembers about Peter Miller. Now, I'm sure all of you can remember or would think that a friend is something that creates a border around something which you want to point attention to. 
or that somebody wants to draw your attention to. Just like the white border around the little red sign which says stop, which you might have just driven past. <coughs> like Peter's hair used to be when he was young, red <laughs> and fiery. You might also think that a frame could be around a beautiful, exquisite artwork because it would be all cluttered if you don't have a frame around. So another thing my dance instructor taught me, the male part of the dance in ballroom dance is like a frame, and the lady is the movable picture. <laughs> so the frame is what makes things focused. Now, of course, other people might adorn their offices full of all the certificates, like John Hendrick, he's got dozens <laughs> of one's accomplishments and or Toastmasters, perhaps even just Toastmasters accomplishments, or certificates, pictures of your wife and children, and those things adorn your office because they are framed. People can see them. You like to show them off. I'm sure Peter Miller has a certain thing which you want to discuss now because when it started off, this piece of clothing was used when he was young. It was the hippie era. And if you wore this item of clothing, you were seen as part of the establishment. And of course, you didn't want to be that. In the 70s, they got shorter and wider. <laughs> they were made of funny materials and bold colors. And then, of course, the 80s came along. And by wearing this item of clothing, formed a part of the a respected, wealthy, and successful. But of course, Peter Miller was always different. When the colors started to match the suit that you had to wear, this is where it all just faded into insignificance. And this item of clothing, in its origin, was exactly this, that it had to collar up your collar because it was so cold, you didn't want to get a cold, so you wore a tie. But of course, in South Africa, it is so hot. <laughs> you don't wear ties. For the last 10 years, I haven't seen Peter Miller with a tie. And today, guess what? <laughs> so of course, I remember at Peter's 30th anniversary, we had Toastmasters honored him for being a member of Toastmasters. We nailed his tie to a frame. <laughs> you put a, oh well, to a picture board and you put a frame around it. And I hope that one of those, that frame is hanging in his office or his study next to all his other achievements so that he can have the excuse of saying that he is wearing the tie, but it's at home, 12 inches long, and it's hanging in there. Thank you, Bruno. I would dare suggest that, knowing me as I do, that if the government passed a regulation to make it illegal to wear a tie, then Peter would immediately start wearing <laughs> Another senior member of our forum knows Peter well, and I invite Rob Scarborough to contribute to this event. Please welcome Rob Scott. Session leader, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not sure where Peter is because Peter is a gentleman who doesn't wear a tie. So when I watched her this evening, uh, I nearly fell off my chair when I looked up and I saw somebody sitting there with a tie on. So I'm not sure if that's in line or if the idea that Mr. Mallard doesn't wear a tie. If that's part of his strategy, it is a memory after all, but I do wonder about that. Peter, I've known for a long time and got to know Peter very well. I do remember, I, had, I was thinking about today, I, did, I think I was at his 40th birthday party in the garden of a house in Arcadia. So that's a while ago. <laughs> Peter's wife, Sandra, my wife, Jean, went to school together. So. There'd been lots of talk and lots of happiness, lots of achievements down the years. Peter also is my mentor. So 
So he's never been up and in my face. But he's always been around to perhaps quietly ask a question or softly ask a question or softly give some advice if he thinks things are not going too smoothly. He's always been there. I always thought, if I really got trouble, I'd pick up the phone and I said, Peter, what do you think? What about this? How do we do that? And he's given his opinion. And if you know Peter, it's not always a soft opinion. It's usually, it may be in it with a soft voice, but it's not a soft opinion. But I have also seen him um, stretch out a little bit. Should we say, I've seen him when he's not in his in a comfort zone. I've seen him when we wondered where Peter was. He was late for a meeting. But he hadn't been told that the, the venue had been changed. And we were waiting in town and he was wandering around somewhere else looking. <laughs> Peter with his red hair had rather a similar colored face. <coughs> I've seen Peter cross, yes. Peter had his, has his own way and always has. And it must be quite confusing for him. After 40 years service would make him a 55 or 60 at least. <laughs> <laughs> and a birthday coming and a birthday coming in a day or two. But Peter spent almost all his life in opposition to the government. <laughs> all his life. Until about two years ago he started being part of the governing of a governing structure. So for a while, I think Peter must have wondered, what, what's all this about? I haven't yet asked him, and perhaps one day he'll tell us, which is the more difficult, being in opposition or being in government? <laughs> we'll, get those, we'll get those answers at some stage, I'm sure we will. Peter always has been a little bit different. We've heard Bruno and Will mentioned things that happened many years ago. But somewhere in my memory, I remember Peter doing a speech about a very hot country up in West Africa somewhere. And I think I saw him standing with very little on. So I'm not sure <laughs> if, was, if I remember correctly, were they blue underpants or were they red underpants? Standing behind the leg. Were they red? <laughs> So if you think Peter's a, a real gentleman and well, well dressed tonight, he can be slightly different. But Peter, the way you are, with your sometimes soft voice but with very strong opinions, all the memories that we have over the very many years, all the advice that's been given, all the involvement in the club activities, the committees you've been on for conferences, etc. All those experiences, all those bits of advice have been fantastic for this club. We've had lots of fun on the way, and I'm sure, I don't want to be around in 40 years' time, but I'm sure for a, a few years yet, we'll see the smiling Peter Miller. This is session here. Thank you, Rob. You are all aware that we have in our club a very distinguished Toastmaster, distinguished Toastmaster, who is a past district governor and is highly respected not only in our province and in our area, but in fact throughout Southern Africa. The Toastmasters all know of him and recognize him. I'm going to ask him to give us some of his memories of Peter's education and an in insight into Peter's most memorable speech, to which Rob has already alluded. Please help me welcome distinguished Toastmaster Ian Flynn. <laughs> Session leader, ladies and gentlemen, if I were to ask you, how do you know if someone went to Pretoria Boys High School? answer is, he will tell you. <laughs> In fact, a year ago I was telling our district director that I attended the 50th 
anniversary of my class of 68 at Victoria Boys High School. And I'm surprised to say that the school is in a better state today than it even was in those days. But believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, the maverick whom we are celebrating this evening, his 40th year, did not like school and has got not a good word about his school, schooling at Pretoria Boys High School. In fact, Mr. K.P. Jones, my maths teacher, also taught Peter maths. But halfway through his first year at maths, Mr. Jones said, Peter, I want you to stay off to class. She did, he said, please join me at the back of the classroom. And I want you to choose from some of the professions that are listed here. So there was an electrician, there was a plumber, panel beater, and a few others. And Peter naturally took exception to that particular sarcastic remark and all of a sudden moved from maths and didn't do maths and never completed maths or science for his matric year at Victoria Boys High School. <laughs> But he grew to the extent that following school, many of you won't know that he spent time at a very prominent men's outfitters in Victoria. Manlings was the name, if I remember correctly. And in those days, you would go to an outfitter and you were fitted the way you should be. Right? And I remember going for a new suit for the company I worked for at the time and it took great time and pride in making sure that I had the right colour, the right cut, etc. And it took even more time in ensuring that I had a tie <laughs> to match the suit that I was going to be wearing. <laughs> How times have changed. And to the extent, if I can pick up on what Rob said, yes, he delivered that speech, how hot it was in the Ivory Coast, the visit that he had. And we were lucky, in fact, with the green underpants. <laughs> <laughs> and I have the camera and the shot that I used to record it. And for those of you who would like to see that, it really did happen. And we can very, Bravely say we were lucky that the red light stopped when we got to the green light. Right, we said green underpants. <laughs> <laughs> he put a new requirement into what we know as body language. <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, Peter, as you know, progressed into becoming an estate agent and then a politician. Two wonderful career paths, if you think about it. <laughs> I'm reminded of Robbie Byrne, who said that a promising young man should go into a promising young man should go into politics so that he can go on promising for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Twain also said that politicians and natives should be changed often and for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm sure you all agree, he has grown up, he does look the part, and apart from his abhorrence to the school he attended, he has grown up to even wearing a tie here this evening. Mr. Session. <laughs> Thank you, Ian, and we are often asked why is this club a men's only club? Where would you find a woman who wants to come and watch a man strip down to his underpants? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we are a man. No, good body. <laughs> <laughs> I return to this of Tony's perspectives, <laughs> and I add his views on Peter's qualities. And again, in out of respect to Tony, I read his comments verbatim. The sterling qualities, of which there are many, that he has imbued into our club and its members in all spheres of Toastmasters International, speaking, evaluating, leadership, regular attendance. He is absent only when his city duties as a city councillor require his attendance at city council meetings. He has contributed most positively to the club, 
uh, with his 40 years membership. And in addition, he has added spice to our meetings. Forum would have been vastly the poorer without Peter Miller. I, Tony, and all of us are greatly richer <coughs> for having known. You, you can see it's Tony's writing. I mean, he is in view now. I had to look up what he knew. Further, Tony reminds us of an event that did not unsettle this traveling vagabond. Tony recalls that Peter's ability to cope with totally unexpected circumstances without losing his elan, another Tony word, without losing his elan, this time when as a young man, we took him many, many years ago, he was canvassing for the Progressive Party. Now you will see how many years ago it was. For an upcoming election. He knocked at the door of a home in Waterloo and found himself face to face with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Albert Herzog. Peter took it in his stride, spoke to the leader of the Hastafta Nationale Partei. They had a cordial and gentlemanly chat over a cup of tea. Nothing frightens Peter <laughs> Not even, not even Dr. Albert Elson. Allow me to add a few uh, um, aspects onto, Tony's, onto Peter's life. Peter is to me a most caring and supportive person. He has always been encouraging and caring at all times towards his late wife, Sam. She tried hard, but she never succeeded in rattling his bars. But she was always very proud of his achievements. His concern for their houseboy, name of Rufus, also passed on, was a measure of how much this man cared for those around him and for those who cared for him. <clears throat> now Rufus from time to time would take Peter to a soccer stadium to watch a local soccer match. The racial mix at the stadium was in the ratio of 1 to 28,999. <laughs> but it's interesting that he accompanied Rufus, showed his, com his concern for Rufus, Particularly when you think that he doesn't even know how many players there are in the soccer. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, he doesn't even own a Bouvazer. <laughs> so if you see any replays of those matches, you see a little white spot. <laughs> in the middle, you can say, there's been a Miller. <laughs> and I mention these things because they are indicators of this man's concern for his late wife, his late manservant, Rufus and for those who cared about him and looked after him. Peter is a renowned gourmet. He is a fine judge of food, but he does not eat vegetables. <laughs> Peter, we respect your Epicurean assessments of food, particularly from a man who cannot even boil an egg. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest this evening is a gentleman, a maverick, and to quote from my fair lady, a man who has the milk of human kindness by the courting every bank. Please ensure that your glasses are charged. Please rise. Bring with me a toast to Peter Miller. Peter, Peter, Peter Miller. Miller.